Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to, uh, first of all, extend a warm welcome to all the visitors uh, this morning that have come down to share this weekend uh, here with us. We would like to thank each of you for making the effort to join us here this weekend. It is our hope that this weekend will be mutually beneficial for all. Well, this morning then, uh, our theme is controlling the tongue. And specifically, the topic we are going to begin with is parents love thy children. Now, when I got into this subject, uh, you know, sometimes you're not sure exactly where it's going to go. Uh, but as you study it through, it sort of leads you the direction of the uh, Word of God. So I endeavored to do that, but sometimes things don't quite come out the way you anticipated them. Um, and I did have a pile of information here. I had to try to condense it and uh, do the best I could. But I seriously believe this topic could be turned into an entire gathering. So <clears throat> now, first of all, when we look at this topic, we have to acknowledge that there is a great deal of confusion surrounding the topic of loving our children. And this actually comes from con the confusion surrounding raising children. I believe it would be beneficial for us then to try to understand where this confusion is coming from in order to make a decision on what is truth and what is myth. In other words, for us to correctly and effectively love our children the way God desires, I believe we need to understand where the confusion is coming from. And when I say confusion, I'm referring to a mixture of ideas on how we love our children and how we should raise them, etc. Whenever I'm about to do something like begin a new project, I want to know why I'm doing it. What is the purpose? What do I hope to achieve? What is my goal? Now this is a legitimate question when it comes to raising children as well. What is my goal in raising children? When all the smoke is cleared, when our children are full grown adults, what do you want him or her to be? Now this is how we need to enter or approach this topic. What am I trying to accomplish? Well, we all know that Christ is our example. He is the manifestation of God's Word. He is what we hope to achieve if we could be just a little more like someone. Christ's character is what we are trying to become. We know he lived life just like us. He's been there. He's been in our shoes. He's seen the same trials we have. He's been tested in all points like us. Jesus' example is what we have been given then to model our lives after. And we don't find a spiritually irresponsible Jesus so we could take examples from his life all the way through. He is the complete package start to finish. So we move towards the end of Jesus' life in Scripture, and we read in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. It says in chapter, Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, we have all read this verse many times over the years, and we know it well. But do we recognize what Jesus is really saying here? We understand from other places in Scripture that Jesus, at this point in his life, was in great agony over his trial of death on the cross. Sometimes I think we think of him as superhuman where this trial of being crucified or being nailed down to a pole of wood wouldn't have been a big deal because he was God's son. We may think that somehow it must have been somewhat easier or less painful for him. But we think about it 
But, pardon me, when we think about it, we know that's not correct. Jesus did not want to go through this crucifixion. He said, not my will. He said, his will was that this cup, or this crucifixion, would pass from him. He didn't look forward to this occasion. And he did it because it was his Father's will. So we read this, and we understand the goal or objective that he has left for us. Jesus was given, or pardon me, Jesus has given us a vision. As the mature son, the child of God, he has shown us the way. He says, not my will, but thine be done. This is one of the deepest principles that Christ left for us to follow. But it is foundational and it is essential to our future. Not my will, but thine be done. In other words, we must learn to deny ourselves and obey God. Now this principle is consistent with many other places in Scripture. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So how does all of this relate to loving our children? Why are we discussing Christ's crucifixion? It may seem very strange and very detached from our topic today, but it isn't, I assure you. In the world today, we have much confusion when it comes to loving our children. Questions like, how do we love our children? When do we love them? How much do we love them? How little do we love them? Where does discipline fit in? How does discipline affect our child's inner well-being or psychological state. In the 1960s, a revolution began on many fronts in the United States. This was not conventional war with guns and bombs, but rather a revolution of propaganda, new ideas, protests against traditional life. By the 1970s, a cynicism or bitterness and general disrespect had developed towards all forms of traditional authority, of which there are five. Political, military, institutional, church, and family. We may recall this as things like Woodstock, where 400,000 young people gathered in the spirit of love and sharing, mostly sharing sex and drugs. Flower power, hippies, who endorsed drugs, rock music, mystic religions, and sexual freedom, as well as the use of marijuana. Out of all this came the birth of women's rights and feminist, feminism, movements uh, towards civil rights issues. The Supreme Court even decided that prayer was unconstitutional. In short, man was asserting his own rights and denying all control of any authority. This epitomized, my will, not thine, be done. During this time, traditional Christian religions were attacked, and mystical Eastern religions were turned to. Anything that was mainstream and traditional was attacked. Men began growing long hair, and women began wearing miniskirts, all in an effort to say, you're not the boss over me. Sound familiar? It was the flesh shining brightly, saying, My will be done. I don't care what God's will is, or anyone else's, each to their own. It makes us think of Judges, chapter 17, verse 6, where we read, But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The traditional family was also attacked by psycho uh, psychologists and other mental health professionals allied with neo-feminists. 
These people worked to prove that traditional family exerted its domination over women and manipulation of children. They believed that the traditional family ensured girls would grow up willing to be dominated by men who had been trained as boys to disrespect and dominate females. Feminists equated traditional marriage with slavery and promoted open marriages in which neither party was obligated to be faithful. Feminists allied with newspapers, television, and radio to further demonize men as natural aggressors and unfit to raise children. Finally, mental health professionals such as psychologist Thomas Gordon authored a best-selling parenting book that claimed traditional child rearing is suffocating the natural child. Also leading this movement were men like Dr. Benjamin Spock, Dr. Joyce Brothers, and Karl Marx, who said in order for socialism to succeed, the traditional family had to go, and go it has. God's design was clearly laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Further to this passage, we read in Ephesians 6 and 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. So we clearly see the pattern that God left. He begins with God as the head, then Christ, then man, then woman, and finally children. After the upheaval of, 19, of the 1960s, that pattern has become completely inverted or turned upside down. Now, where God once resided in most people's lives, schools, courthouses, and even on U.S. currency such as coins and paper currency, where the words, in God we trust, was, God is being dismissed from schools people's lives, and the empty church pews are a testament to that. The man of the home has been reduced to secondary power in the home, not believed fit to run the household, and has been reduced to basically one of the children. By quickly flipping on our radios or TVs, testimony to this exists. And as we hear advertisements and television shows continually make man out to be the idiot. Incapable without the direction of the much wiser woman. This is the power of media control. Mothers, by default, have come to believe they are solely responsible for the operation of the family, and any good that is to come must come through them. Children have taken the status of the served. They are waited on by mother and father and have become the center of the family universe and the world's universe. What can get the ball rolling more quickly than news of crimes and injustices against children? All of this came from the 1960s and has been built on and developed on ever since. In fact, as of March 26, 2013, which is only a couple of days ago, there was 156,993 books under the title Parenting currently in print and listed on Amazon.com. Almost without exception, none of them teach what you and I read from Scripture. This is the subtle, beguiling speech of the serpent, telling all who will listen, you shall not surely die if you raise your children according to my theories and forsake God's. We are all familiar with the man named Charles, Dickens, or Charles Darwin. He too could not accept what God told us about the creation 
of our earth and man on it. In his human arrogancy, he chose to refuse what God said and create his own theory. A new way he wanted, something new under the sun. He developed the theory of evolution and decided that his way, not God's, was correct. We know how wrong he was, but how many millions are and were fooled. The theory of how family should be directed and how a child should be loved is much the same. God has left us a pattern of how to raise and love our children. He instructed us through his word. Man, namely psychologists, decided that God's way was foolish and developed their own evolutionary theory, but this time it was on parenting. It is as wrong as Darwin's theory of evolution, but the time will come, says Timothy, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Today we're told not to discipline, that we are to use behavioral modification techniques, rewarding good behavior but never showing negativity towards inappropriate behavior. We are told that children are a free spirit and not to suffocate that innocence and creativity. We are told to show when they misbehave uh, to allow the child to graduate from classes, or pardon me, we are told to love when they misbehave and to allow children to graduate through classes when they actually failed. Children should never receive an X on their examinations as this is negative and hurtful to their psychological state. In fact, the honor roll as of next year has been discontinued because children will no longer be given grades in percentages, but rather in categories. These categories will be from 1 to 4. You will no longer get a 50% or a 90% or a 75%. You will be graded from 1 to 4. So as not to hurt the feelings of the other children in class that don't do as well in school. Self-esteem is everything, we're told by psychologists, and the reason any child fails is due to damage to their self-esteem. We are taught that a child's feelings are more important than anything else. If a child's feelings are hurt, that child is scared for, or pardon me, scarred for life. We have to ask ourselves, how does all of this square with Scripture? What was God's intentions? Has He left us any real instructions on raising children and loving children? Let's go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Again, we read Christ's words. He says, Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Now what do we notice here about Jesus' words? Do we notice the attention he is trying to draw to humility? Do we notice he put himself away in the background? Do we see the opposite of arrogance? The theory of evolution came about because man, in his arrogance, did not want to accept God's explanation of how the earth was created. Eve in the garden partook of the forbidden fruit because she did not want to accept God's rule of thou shalt not eat. The rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram was all about their will, not God's, be done. They didn't want God's selection of who would run the camp. We have a natural desire to do our own will, not God's or any authority. God has given us one task, and that is to do His will. 
that takes humility. We have to be humble enough to accept his ways and bold enough to resist man's. That takes control. Not my will, Christ says, but thine be done. Now we've been left some very insightful instruction regarding this in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12. If we read in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12, it says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And that word haughty means arrogant. And before honor is humility. In another place in Proverbs, it says, God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your humility. So how do we show humility? Is it not by accepting what God has written in Scripture and by rejecting the philosophies of man? Is it not by accepting God created the earth, just like he says, and not believing in evolution? Is it not by accepting what God says about loving and raising our children and not listening to what the world is trying to tell us? If we read the books that are out there teaching us how to raise children it is pretty much a guarantee that our children will not be in the kingdom. The world teaches us to build up our children's self-esteem, to let them do their will, to allow them to find themselves and to develop according to their own will. How does that philosophy fit with what God has taught us? Not my will but thine be done. We are to learn to esteem God as the greatest of all. We are to learn to submit to authority, to elders, and to parents. If we were to go and look up the word esteem, we would discover that it means to think highly of. And it's synonymous with the word worship. To build up self-esteem, then, is to think highly of yourself and to worship yourself. Is this what Scripture teaches? Is this the direction God would have us to go? If we go to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we read what Christ has to say on this matter. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When we analyze where man's philosophies are going, as compared with what we're taught, we will soon see there's huge discrepancies. Teaching our children to worship themselves will never get them to the kingdom. Our journey is one of self-denial. It is one of of obedience to God, and we are instructed to do that daily. Are we denying ourselves daily? It is so easy to lose track of where we're heading. The world can be very convincing. It has a way of taking a partial truth and mixing it with lies to make us believe it is the truth. We have to stay sharp. We have to keep the vision of where we're going clear in our minds. In Proverbs 29 and verse 18 it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. In order for our children to one day submit themselves willingly to Christ, we have to ask, is the direction they are heading going to get them there? Is the direction we are parenting going to get them there? 
This is probably the number one litmus test we can do for ourselves and our children. Check. Are the skills that my children are learning moving him or her toward submitting to God? Scripture says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is often easy to read, but very, very difficult to do. Even when we want to train a child in the way he should go, it appears there is very little guidance left in Scripture for us to use. As a result, we have often turned to books written by man for instruction on raising children, and this is the beginning of our troubles. If we use man's instructions to get to God, we are heading in opposite directions. Man has demonstrated very well over and over again how he cannot direct himself, so why would we go to him for help? In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 11 to 13, and I'll read this from the New International Version, it says, The words of the wise are like goads. Their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Solomon here recognizes the wise words of God and not the many books of man. The only books that contain useful information are ones based on God's word. All other books will assist uh, pardon me, all other books will assist us in keeping our children out of the kingdom and from becoming wonderfully sound characters with deep principles and convictions. We are often frustrated at the silence of the Bible that the silence of the Bible seems to convey on this and many subjects. It seems vague and unclear. The reason for this is because when we go to scriptures looking for clear and concise we go to scriptures looking for clear and concise directions, such as Thus saith the Lord, when little Johnny will not hearken, do this. The Bible is not written like that. And it does require digging, studying, and work. If we start out with basic principles and hold them up as standards in our families, we will soon be able to add to them. As we pointed out in 1 Corinthians 11 and 3, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. We must start with the godly design. We may not like this. I may not like this. You may not like this. But this is God's design. Not my will, Christ said, but thine be done. This is, a, uh, this is starting to lead us towards God's ultimate will. So we understand that God is Christ's head, and the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the child is to be in subjection to both. Now we have discussed this same subject in in a recent study in the Kings, and I asked the question then, and I'll ask it again. If you want to know if you have been deceived by the humanistic uh, movement of the 1960s, Listen to this verse and think about whether it is shocking to you or not. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Do we find that statement shocking? Now think about the serpent sliding over to you and saying, Thy husband shall not rule over thee. This is precisely what man has been teaching us. We all have to learn humility 
and to be subject to those leading us. Jesus himself learned to submit, even though he was the Son of God. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, And he, that's Jesus, went down with them, his mother and father, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. In order to really love our children, we must raise them by God's divine plan. It is the plan that many, many families used to raise their children by, but in the last 50 years, it has all but disappeared. We don't have to look far to see the results of this non-godly way of raising children. Anyone that has worked with the new wave of teenagers and college students coming down the pipe knows that something is desperately wrong. The foundational core values of quality characters is missing. Things like accountability, commitment, self-respect, professionalism, integrity, and so on. So how do we get there? How do we raise children that are quality characters with God's best interest in mind. One of the first myths we must address is that children are fundamentally good. That sounds harsh, but that's exactly what Scripture says. In other words, society teaches that children are naturally near angelic, and it is only by negative experiences that they develop bad behavior. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, it says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now the word foolishness here is translated in other places folly, which means moral depravity. This means that, it is, that in any given situation, a child is inclined to do uh, things evil, or the self-serving thing, and consider his own interests before anyone else's. We should not be shocked at this. They possess human nature just like you and I. Because they are young and cute, does this make them less filled with human nature than the rest of us? Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. David also wrote of himself, acknowledging his sinful state at birth. He says in Psalms 51 and 5, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We must understand that we are all sinful. It's built right into our nature. We all know, pardon me, we all know that and accept that. Can we accept that about children? If we can, what can we do about it? Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12 says, The Lord disciplines those who he loves as a father the son he delights in to understand love we must try to understand God and not man God disciplines those he loves now can we take that information and apply it to raising our own children is this instruction to us or is this just information we can take or leave depending on our own personal feelings. How about this verse? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him disciplines him betimes. The word betimes here indicates early. So we understand it to read that he that loveth him disciplines him or his son early. This could mean he disciplines him early or quickly, shortly after the offense, or it may indicate when he is very young. I believe, combined with other scripture, it is quite likely both. 
We may also notice a common link of words here. <clears throat> time and time again, in Scripture, the words love and discipline are put together. And when we start to look for it, we will see it more and more. It has been said that love and discipline are two sides of the same coin. I believe Scripture conveys that, ex that exact idea. Not only in actual words, but in principles and in lessons. We cannot love without discipline. It's that simple, and yet it's that hard to wrap our heads around. Where society has taught us that discipline is evil, God tells us that it is love. Proverbs 29 verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. It is amazing to me how plainly God tells us what to do in raising children and how we have uh, somehow missed these vital principles. We cannot raise ch our children as society has directed if we expect to deliver them back to God a God having divine, or a, pardon me, a child having divine principles that will submit to Him one day. Are we humble enough to accept the directive that God has given us? Under the law of Moses, in times past, we read in Deuteronomy, chapter twenty-one, verse eighteen: If a man have a stubborn, stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him or disciplined him, he will not hearken unto them, then shall the father and mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say to the elders of the city, This is our son. He is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now I'm not suggesting we reinstitute stoning children. <laughs> the question is, what is God trying to teach we recall the verse where God said, I am the Lord, I change not. If God changes not, and God is love, how do we harmonize these two concepts? God is love, but he required the rebellious son to be stoned. We could certainly see why any loving parent would do everything within their power to train up their child into obedience. Can you imagine turning your child over to be stoned because he is stubborn and rebellious? Discipline in this situation is very easily seen as being love. Let's ask ourselves now, if our children grow up being rebellious, are we not also going to be delivering them up to be destroyed at the Day of Judgment? Is not discipline then the deepest form of love you can bestow on them? If we go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, we read the words of Paul. It says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. God is a God of love, but right here he endorses discipline as a means of bringing about peace and righteousness. Which one of us would not want peace and righteousness in our homes? Discipline must be painful, we're told. Human nature does not subside with hugs and kisses. Hugs and kisses and love will come, but it starts with correction. 
This is God's design. Can we really improve on it? Can we really say this is not uh, this is not right? This isn't going to work. Are we really humble? Can we accept this concept? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, Because the Lord disciplines those He loves and punishes everyone He accepts as a son. Our children are products of ourselves. They have the same constitution that you and I have. We all possess human nature. When a child is born, they are really quite innocent. Each child is different, and yet each one is the same. For the first year and a half to two years, we do everything for them. We are essentially servants to them. They rely on us, and we provide for them. Most of the time, the, those babies are quite content. We are basically serving the flesh. However, those babies at that age are already learning how to get their needs fulfilled and they notice how mom and dad, especially, as well as others, are Johnny on the spot when they need something. I think I'd be content too. But notice how uh, their disposition changes when they are not getting what they want. You may have heard of the terrible twos. I think everyone has. This is an example of what happens when that child has matured to the point where we, mom and dad, are no longer keeping up with their needs and those little toddlers are not happy. In their little worlds, they have basically been running the show and now moms and dads are not performing up to task. Where did they learn this? Well, they didn't learn it. It's built in. It's called My Will Be Done. And it starts, and it's the start of rebellion against anything that gets between them and self satisfaction. Now, the natural reaction for many of us is to give in and try to accommodate. We feel the guilt of them being so small and helpless, and we are confused about the whole love thing, and we want peace. So we cave in. But trust me when I say they now have your number. These little fellows are not stupid. They learn quickly and they are designed to please the flesh. God has placed you in their lives to teach them. They need to learn self-control and it's a long course. Not only that, but you may have multiple students in different levels of training, like little brothers and sisters. You are their teacher, and your spouse is your counterpart. One of the first things you need to do to make sure you're both teaching, pardon me, one of the first things you need to do is make sure you're both teaching from the same curriculum. Otherwise, you may be undoing what the other is attempting to teach. These little dudes will find cracks and inconsistencies quicker than you and I do, and they will tear you apart. We need to base our training on God's Word. Remember, if it's not based on God's Word, get rid of it. It will lead you away from your goal. Keep the vision clear in your mind. What is my goal for my child? Is it to teach them humility? where they can say, not my will, but thine be done? Is what we're allowing our children to do or not to do consistent with our goal of teaching them, not my will, but thine be done? Do they do your will or do they do their own will? Is your yea, yea, and your nay, nay, do we give a clear message to our children, or are we wishy-washy? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17,
we read, and this is out of the New International Version, Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that at the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? As parents, we are leaders. Fathers are the heads of the house. Mothers operate with the fathers as one flesh. Fathers are not dismissed from their responsibilities as leaders of the house. The direction that the family takes is ultimately your responsibility. Each one of us as fathers are supposed to have graduated from learning to rule over ourselves to the point where we can rule well our own houses. Are we doing that? Or are we relieving that responsibility to our wives? Are our children in subjection to us? Do our children know we love them? Do we spend time teaching them uh, whenever we're around them about God's principles, as it says in scriptures? Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19 says, You shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God's word isn't learned exclusively on Sunday mornings. Our children need us to teach every day throughout our day. Are we around for that? Are we making time for them? I think this is a fitting verse in John chapter 15, verse 13. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that, he, that a man lay down his life for his friends. How are we laying down our lives if it is not for the furtherance of the truth? And what better way to do this than to teach our children? We must remember that these aren't our children, they're God's. We have an opportunity now to influence them. Which way will that be? We must realize that we are a family unit and a team with God as our head. As a unit, we work together, we play together, and we learn together. Parents are not here to serve children. Mothers are not to shoulder the responsibility of raising and holding a family together. Fathers are not to be lightly esteemed. Children are to respect, are to be respected enough to be made responsible for their choices and loved at all times, disciplined uh, being an intricate part of that. We are all moving toward that goal of Christ's return. The lives of our children depend on us as parents. Children, the salvation of your parents has a lot to do with your development. You can help a lot in your families, the salvation and in your own. In the beginning, God created male and female, man and woman, and they became one flesh. Why did he create two to become one flesh? In Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, we see the answer. It says, And did not he make one? Wherefore one? that he might seek a godly seed. We need to take note of the word godly here, because I think it's very important. We are not here, pardon me, we're not made one flesh to produce seed. We are here to produce a godly seed. The only way we could produce a godly seed is by loving them enough to raise them according to godly ways. Otherwise, they are just seeds of the flesh, and this does not fit with the divine plan. Numbers chapter 14, verse 21 says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. When I was a kid, I used to believe that one day God would shine this big glory flashlight on the earth, and it would be filled with his glory. 
But I've come to realize that the glory he was referring to was a godly seed. All the righteous people throughout the last 6,000 years that glorified God and submitted to Him and His commandments, they will fill the earth. Listen to what it says about the end of man's reign on earth after Christ's return and the overthrow of the nations on earth. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, and you're welcome to look that one up. It's uh, a few verses there. I forgot to remove this. This is the pattern of the things, the way man has got them set up now. God was the head. Christ came next. Man next, woman next, and children. That's God's divine plan. On the other side is the way it's basically set up in the world today. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, it says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. And when all things shall be subdued unto him or Christ, then shall the Son or Christ also himself be subject unto him that God may be all in all. In the end, when everything and everyone has submitted to Christ, he himself turns and lays it at God's feet and submits himself to God. If that is the example, then now is the time to conquer ourselves and help our children to do the same. What if we are not parents then, or if our children are grown up and moved on? Is there any instruction in all of this for you? Well, again, I believe if we go back to God's purpose with all of us, we recognize He is looking for a godly seed. There are examples in Scripture of men like Paul, the Apostle, who we know did not have children. But can we say that he did not raise a godly seed? Notice what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. He says, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commitment thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Also, he says in Philemon, Chapter 1, verse 10, Paul speaking again, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus. Notice how Paul collectively addresses the converted Jews in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, Paul says, My son, despise not the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked. Again in the book of Peter, the church that is in that is at Babylon saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Paul did not have his own children, but did that prevent him from getting involved in raising a godly seed and adopting many spiritually as his own children? We can be involved in raising a godly seed any time, and in a multitude of ways. They don't have to be our own children. We simply have to teach them to submit to our Father. If we can minimize the gap between our children submitting to us, their earthly fathers, and submitting to their heavenly Father, then we have done our jobs. Controlling our tongue is much more than refraining from speaking evil. It is about stepping up to the plate and witnessing or teaching God's word. Paul says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. 
May our yea be for God and our nay be against the flesh.